I'm Marion Keyes and you are very welcome to this special evening. Um, tonight we're going to be in conversation with the very wonderful Louise O'Neill. When her first book was published in 2015, no, 2014, only ever yours, it caused a sensation. And since then, every one of her novels has started conversations and gone on to become bestsellers. Her latest novel, After the Silence, is in my humble opinion, the best yet. I'm going to read what the Irish Times said about it at the weekend. Pulsing with a relentless dreamlike intensity, After the Silence is a compelling read, a beautiful, unsettling, gothic novel. The reviews have been amazing and it's gone straight in at number two in the bestseller list. Um, there is so much more I could talk about, um, but we'll leave it to the woman herself. Ladies and gentlemen, Louise O'Neill. Hi, I have no idea what is going on with my camera, which seems to have gone completely dark. dark. We can, we can, we can hear you. We can yeah, I don't know what's happening because we, we did the test and it was perfect. So, can you see a little bit there? Well, it's anyway, I'm going to look like a ghost figure. Yeah, but that's okay. We'll because, because they did say it was a gothic novel. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, this is what it is. I'm... Okay. I don't know exactly. I have no idea what's going on. It was, it was perfect in the, when we were testing it. Don't worry. Don't worry. This is the joys of live. You know, everything to do with technology. I'm like, why? Why does technology hate me so much? Technology is wonderful because listen, if it wasn't for te technology, we wouldn't be talking at all, and we no, would know. Like we, it is. It is a wonderful thing. No, that's true. I mean, I do look like I'm coming from like either the the future or the distant past to, no, to say hello Victorian, so Victoria yeah. and it, it really suits you yeah <laughs> and we're going to talk about clothes in a little while but first of all congratulations on after the silence it went straight in at number two after three days sales are you happy God, it's I mean you know, it's one of those things where, and you know this yourself, Marion, when you feel that someone has parted with their hard earned money, you know, to pay for something, you know, that you've been working on, that you're putting out into the world, like, it, it does feel like an honour, you know, you do feel, I think, really just so incredibly grateful to everybody who has, you know, who's bought it. And it, yeah, so today was a little bit surreal when I heard, um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm delighted. I mean, in my opinion, it is your most mature, um, and it's, I suppose, a slight departure in, I was going to say genre, in that it is ostensibly a psychological thriller, um, but it's much more than that, like it's really a novel about coercive control. Can you, for people who haven't read it or who haven't read reviews, will you tell us? Yeah, of course. Without, without um, okay, well... After the Silence is set on an island off the coast of West Cork called Inishroon. Um, and this very glamorous, wealthy family called the Kinsellas have set up this world-renowned artist retreat centre there. Um, and the youngest Kinsella son, Henry, has married a, a local woman called Keelan. And it's at Keelan's 36th birthday party that this violent storm engulfs the island, completely shutting it off from the mainland. And then the next morning, a body of a young woman is found. You know, no one can get on the island and no one can get off the island. So it has to have been someone here who did this. And then 10 years later, a team of documentary makers come to Inishroon Island, determined to find out exactly what happened that night. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and it's like, it is so atmospheric. In a way, like the island itself is, is like another character in the novel. What yeah. me was though, like, you know, you're in your early 30s and the, the main woman in this, Keelan, is 47, she's perimenopausal, like, and you inhabited her so convincingly. Um, could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, you're right. I mean, for part of the um, novel, Keelan is 36, and then for the um, other part, you know, it's 10 years later. And it's the first time that I've ever written a character who is older than I am. Um, and, you know, Keelan is, you know, in her mid forties, she um, has two children, she's married. Um, and those are all experiences that I haven't had. Um, and I think in a way, it was partly that I just decided that I really needed to push myself um, because, 
you know, with the first four novels, I think there were aspects of all of those characters that I could really relate to myself and to my own experience. And I just felt like as an author, like I couldn't continue to keep writing the same story or the same kind of characters over and over again. Um, so I think for me, it was like, okay, I really want to try this. Um, and I wanted to get it right because, you know, obviously, even the way I feel physically at 35 is very different to the way that I felt physically at 25. Um, and I just, I was, so I spoke to people who were in um, their mid forties because I really wanted to get a sense of like, what does it feel like to be in your body? And it was not even just physically, like on a societal level, like how people react to you. Um, because I think as a woman, like I suppose you've been taught from such an early age, that like, a lot of your currency comes from like your beauty um, and uh, I suppose your attractiveness. Um, and we're also conditioned to believe that that tends to dissipate as you get older, even though, I mean, I think as a society, we really need to challenge this. Um, and you are a perfect example of this because you get hotter every year and I have no <laughs> idea how you're doing it, but I want to know the secrets. Um, so I think that for me, it was just, it was a really interesting um, challenge. And as you said, even just around, um, issues around perimenopause and what does that feel like um, and you know I was I was, was and you were like this Marion we've talked about this in research you know it's it's talking to people and it's asking what are sometimes kind of embarrassing questions you know and, and to be fair most of the time the other person doesn't get embarrassed at all it's just that you feel like you're asking these really personal questions of people but you know actually I'm always surprised by people's generosity and people's willingness to share their own experience um, with you. Yeah, I mean, I, I find the research part of, of, of any novel writing excruciating. Like mm. I hate asking impertinent questions. Now, speaking of questions, Louise is very, very happy to answer anything. So if you just want to type into the chat or the Q&A uh, thing at the bottom of your screen, um, they'll come through to me and, and then at about quarter past eight, we we'll slow things down for the slow set and, uh, and uh, we'll put your questions to Louise. And um, uh, I have nothing to offer you, but I will give a virtual prize for the most interesting <laughs> And there's not going to be a glittering raffle, Marion. I'm disappointed. There's there's I'm nothing. disappointed. There's nothing. I can blow kisses if that's all. <laughs> and listen, in general, how are you? Like, how are you coping with this strange time? Oh my God. It's so weird. Like, and I, you know, you, you feel like, I think, well, I have felt very guilty about this because at the beginning I was like, I'm healthy. My family are healthy. I haven't lost my job. Um, and, you know, I don't have children, which seems to be the one thing that I think would have been very difficult during lockdown is trying to do um, homeschooling as well. But you know what, I, I found it really challenging. Like, I found it really hard to work. My brain felt like it was a bit fuzzy. Like, I just, I couldn't read. I couldn't write. Um, and, you know, my partner, um, you know, is a reporter. So he was in Dublin and that was really, like, a real strain um, on our relationship. Um, so I think it's been a really interesting experience because I think everyone has gone through this or has experienced it differently. And in a weird way, I think it's going to be like a collective trauma nearly, I think that we're going to be reckoning with um, for, for years to come. Yeah, I mean, that thing that you said about not being able to read and, or not being able to write, I mean, there are actual physiological reasons that, that for them. Mm. It's because we're all incredibly frightened. Yeah. And, and to keep us safe, you know, we're in fight or flight mode. So all our headspace has been given over to the logical part of the brain. Um, so we're scanning the horizon for danger. Um, and that means we have no ability to sort of go into our imaginary world. It's, it's not safe. We need to be vigilant the whole time. Um, and that's why I, also people are reporting like incredibly vivid dreams. Oh, yeah. The time. Because in the daytime, we, won't, we can't let our guard down for a second. So when we go to, go to bed at night, if we're lucky enough to sleep, you know, all the, all the imaginative part of our heads gets a workout then. So you're right, like it is. It's... And you, the longer it goes on, yeah. the differenter it becomes. Yeah. Um, 
I think in the in the early days we were all kind of incredibly kind of yeah we're all in this together you know we were outside and come on collectiveness and you know and we thought like four months it'll all be better and yeah. and you know we were all loved up with kind of this collective shared endeavor and yeah. now it's like this kind of dribbly no yeah. end in sight sort of a thing yeah um but it, I mean, it will be okay. It, 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 it will, it will. I mean, and that's actually really interesting about like the two parts of the brain. Um, because I think I did feel enormous guilt about not emerging from lockdown, kind of like clutching a new novel in my hands, you know? Um, so I, I do think that like, it, I suppose it's helpful to look at, it. because I think it's, you know, we've talked about this before, like, I, you know, that idea that like in a capitalist society, that it's not good enough just to survive something like this, that you have to be productive, that you have to learn another language, that you have to, you know, be the best teacher possible to your kids, even though you've never had any sort of training as a teacher. Um, I mean, I did start baking, so I can't kind of, um, I can't, you know, shit on that, but, um, but everything else I think is just this sense like produce, produce, produce. And I don't know, I just was like, I, I can't right now. And yet none of us could. And there was that expectation that we would all learn to play the flute. Or yeah. <laughs> come out of it like speaking conversational Korean. Yet yeah, there's this kind of horrendous um, pressure that every hour of the day must be productive and worthwhile you know and that even like your downtime is scheduled mm. um like uh i have young men on my life nephews and uh they follow people on youtube who live these pretend bullshit lives where you know they get up at six and they meditate for 45 minutes and then they have their omelet and then they have their run and it's horrendous like every second of the day you have to be nour nourishing some mm. part of you it's just it's awful mm. do nothing is my my advice. <laughs> do nothing lie in the couch do sudokus um you know that's a kind of a version of nothing that's just lovely we need especially at the moment we're incredibly fragile you know as you say that there there is we're going to look back at this and think jesus how did we get through it you know yeah. we are getting through it you yeah. know we should be proud of ourselves and you know, Louise, when life is normal, what's it like for you? Well, I feel kind of bad now because you said that getting up and meditating is a terrible idea. And I was going to say, well, I do actually get up and meditate um, because it has been, I, you know what, I, I learned how to do um, transcendental meditation a few years ago. And I know it's really annoying, Marion, I know. Um, but uh, I actually have find it, find it quite helpful. I, I know it's funny, and I'm always really wary of giving sort of blanket advice because I have other friends who've told me that when they try to meditate they say that actually it makes them more anxious because even just stopping to you know like so I think it's I, I'm kind of wary of going this is the one thing that's going to be you know this is the silver bullet that's going to cure you but like I have found that when I meditate in the morning I'm a bit more present for the rest of the day like otherwise I I'm like going to bed that night and like Jesus what what should I do today you know um, but when I'm writing, I tend to, like, I get up, I will do some meditation, I'll have my breakfast, and then I try and get to my desk pretty early, um, and the reason for that is that my brain, I think, is at its most creative, like, even when I was in school, if I had a test, like, I wouldn't be one of those students who would stay awake all night, like, I would always have gotten up at, like, five o'clock that morning and kind of, you know, done my revision then. Um, and, you know, again, when people ask for writing advice, I just think, like, there is no one way, like, you know, my friend Kat, um, you know, writes till 5 a.m. in the morning sometimes, and we'll text each other when she's going to bed and I'm getting up, and I think it's really about figuring out, okay, when do I feel at my most creative, when do I feel at my most productive, um, but yeah, so I try and get my writing done sort of before lunchtime, um, and then, you know, it's funny, because like sometimes with, with this job, you feel like you're such a chancer because a lot of it is, and you know, I'm actually very lucky because my, my parents and my partner are really supportive of this when I'm like, I need to daydream for a bit and I need to go for very long walks and I need to go swimming and I need to, you know, listen to music or I need to watch art or look at art because that's going to like, I suppose the creative brain is such a strange thing to try and understand, but I know that when I do all of those activities, that it helps me 
when I get back to my desk that somehow an image that I've seen or something I've overheard or even just the physical act of walking seems to create some sort of movement um, that will spark an idea. Um, and it's, it's such a strange, like just the act of writing, the act of creating is such a strange thing sometimes. But you, you know, the, it's a bit like dominoes, like the more you do and the more you go with it, the more it generates, the more ideas come. Um, and I think you just have to sort of learn to trust that. Um, and I suppose I'm someone who's so impatient and I want everything now and, and I hate having to wait and I'm such a control freak. And, and actually I think writing has been really helpful for that because I know I can't sit down and write a book in a day. Like I know that I can't click my fingers and the book is gonna be written. Like I know that I'm committed to it, that it's a long project, that it's gonna take months. Um, and that little by little, word by word, day by day, the book will appear. Yeah, I mean, like, I agree with so much. I mean, for me, I think creativity lives in the subconscious. And for me, I have to get past my conscious brain mm -hmm. before I can access it. And that means doing awful things like being alone without stimulation. You yeah. know, that thing of like, going for a walk and having nobody to talk to and nothing yeah. to listen to. Like I find that so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and once I get through that, then I'm able to get into it. Yeah, then it's like opening a door that you can't find the entrance to. Yeah. Um, and yeah. then, yeah, once you're in. So coming back to the book, it's a novel um, about many things, including coercive control. So can you tell me like, how you did your research for that because um to those of you who are watching i saw louise in london i don't know maybe two years ago and she said she was thinking of writing a novel about relationship abuse um i'm not sure of the correct title is it intimate relationship terrorism is that the correct one yeah because that leaves children out um and so when she said that i mean i was very excited but I was expecting that it would be the energy of asking for it that mm. she was going to bring to it. Like I thought it was going to be a very overtly angry book, um, mm. quite rightly. Um, mm. And after the silence is, it's not, it's not that it's not angry, but it is coming back to the review in the Irish Times. It does pulse with the dreamlike intensity. Like it is set on this island, um, which in a way, I mean, all islands are sort of magical. Yeah. Uh, you know, everybody has this idealized thing of like running away to an island and, you know, to be out there in the Atlantic. And, and so there is that dreamlike intensity. And, you know, one of the points that you make so strongly in the book is that like broken bones or, you know, visible bruises, um, that's only a tiny amount of relationships. Relations. Yeah. yeah, in the book, like so many awful things happen. Like um, he buys her these beautiful clothes that are a size too small for her mm. so that she has to starve herself to fit into them, to mm. be beautiful for him. It's all those subtle things are like he, he does, he, she did something to annoy him inadvertently and he did something to her phone then so she couldn't get into it, like she couldn't unlock it. Like that awful thing of leaving her without any way to communicate. So. Mm. Could you tell us a bit about the, the research that you did? Mm, yeah. Well, firstly, I totally agree with you about islands. Um, and it was interesting because I, I spoke to quite a lot of people, like uh, around five people who have grown up on islands. Um, Inishir, Inishmore, um, Cape Clear, Aranmore. Um, and the woman that I spoke to um, who grew up in Aranmore said that when she's home, which I thought was so interesting, she said, when I'm at home on the island, it's the only time I believe in magic. And it, the way that she said it was more that she believed in ghosts, you know, that she said when she would be walking home after the pub, she said it's the, the only time that she believes in like the puka, you know, that she's that she's worried about like spirits. And there was something in there that I thought was really, really interesting. But I suppose when it came to um, course of control, I think the reason why I wanted to address it, well, there were a couple of reasons. Um, I mean, my partner, Richard, had... He had done a series of reports for um, a radio show here in Ireland um, around domestic abuse. Um, and he had said to me, which I mean, it's so funny, which it was, I'd say maybe a week or two after we had started just texting, not even dating. Um, and he said to me something that he had done these reports about um, abuse in rural areas. Um, and then he said, and 
you know, what's really, you know, it's the women on the islands who said that they're even more isolated again because they have to wait for the ferry. Um, and so often by the time that the next ferry comes, you know, things have been resolved or they're hoping that, you know, that, that or they're hoping it'll have been resolved. And um, so that really stuck with me. Um, and I suppose there was a lot of conversation happening around coercive control because charities here that work with domestic abuse were really pushing for a change in legislation to make it illegal. Um, and, you know, to do that, I think that they're, they had to just try and explain what it is because I think there's a real lack of understanding around what it actually is. Um, and it's just the definition of it is, is like a persistent pattern of controlling or threatening behavior that can be physical, it can be emotional, it can be financial, it can be sexual. Um, and I suppose, as you said, like it's so much easier to identify physical abuse because there are bruises or there are broken bones. Whereas with something like this, it's so insidious and sometimes can happen so gradually that actually even the victim themselves doesn't know that it's happening. Um, and I was very lucky to, there's a, a centre here in West Cork called the um, West Cork Women Against Violence Project. And they were just so incredibly helpful. Um, and like, you know, I spoke to the people who worked there and then they organised visits and phone calls um, with survivors um, of this kind of abuse. And I mean, you know, we talked earlier about like people being generous enough to share their stories with you. I mean, I was completely floored by their willingness to be so honest and so vulnerable and so just open with me um, about their experiences. Um, and like, you know, cause obviously Marianne, you've written about this subject as well in this charming man. And, you know, I know that you did a lot of research too. And when you're having those conversations and you're very wary, you're like, I don't want to make, like, I don't want to start crying. I don't want to get upset because this isn't about me. But like you, you would come like well, I would come away and I would just feel hollow. Like you, because I think that we, in order to survive, actually, a lot of the time, I think that we need to create a bubble in which we don't think too closely, for most of the time, about homelessness or direct provision or you know starvation or you know all of like or, or wars or or um uh, you know just so many asylum seekers like so many issues that are going on in the world um and i think that sometimes when you're really confronted with something like this and you realize like how common an experience this is how many women live in terror in their homes which is supposed to be the safest place in the world i think when you're really confronted with just this, the magnitude of that um, and the, like the prevalence of it, it's it's really like it's it's actually quite frightening because I think that it's safer almost to sort of protect yourself and not have to think about it. Um, and it was you know so I think I would come away like I, I did around six months of research, which is the most I've ever done for a book, um, and I would come away sometimes just feeling flattened I think would be the the right way um, to put it um, and I think then you have sort of a sense of responsibility while you're writing it but as you said like this book is really different um, to asking for it and to be honest I think that was a really deliberate decision um, and part of that was that I think that my books had sort of been pigeonholed as issues novels um, so you would see that like a lot of the time it was primarily women who were picking it up anyway. Um, and then you would have some people think, oh, this is too heavy. You know, I, 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 this isn't really what I want to read on my, in my spare time. So with this book, I think I wanted to marry like my very commercial sensibilities, um, but also like sneak in a little bit of, um, a little bit of feminism. And like, to be honest, and um, you know, I remember when I started my career, um, my editor at the time, asked me you know like what kind of books do you want to write and I remember saying that I wanted to be like Marion Keys which is so funny now because like none of my books are funny at all do you know but I think it was that sense of the way in which and I think actually probably this is the closest that, I, that I've ever gotten that like I'm there's a heart like at the heart of the book is this really important issue but like that's not the main point of the book you know and that it's like I suppose that the the, the story is there um, and that you know that you would hope that people would say oh I really want to read this book because it's quite glamorous and you know and that the 
it's compelling and it's a page turner. And then while they're reading it, they're also I suppose being you know thinking about a subject like this, which is something that I think you are the absolute master at. Um, and ha like your entire career, you've been so brilliant at writing these incredibly funny, like just so pop, like really popular, clever books, but that you always have at the heart of them. I think something really important. I, I mean, thank you, Louise. But like um, coming back to your books, like I've loved them all, and I mean. I've never thought that you put an issue ahead of the story. Mm. Um, but what I've loved about all, this is your fifth novel, is how different they've all been. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's wonderful, like only ever yours is, I mean, sort of dystopian science fiction. Um, and asking for it is just, is, is, you know, just such a kind of a howl of rage. And then almost love, I think is very, is very current. You know, it's it's very interiorized. Mm. Um, the surface breaks. I adored it. Uh, for for those of you who don't know, it's a retelling of the Little Mermaid, and Louise is incredibly visual. Like she's a really because Louise loves art and and beautiful things, which we're going to get to in a minute. And like she brings that to the surface breaks, also to um to after the silence, which is you know it's surrounded by sea and it's set in this beautiful place. Um, but Louise, tell us about, well, about your new home and, and the beautiful mm -hmm. things. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny cause I, obviously cause Richard lives in Dublin. We kept thinking like, what would we do? And, you know, would I move there? Would he move here? And obviously his job is so Dublin centric. Um, that I think that we just thought we would maybe wait for a couple of years um, and then figure it out. But, you know, I was living um, with my parents and I think I just felt like I really at this point needed independence, you know, because I mean, obviously, like when I was 18, I moved away. Um, and like every summer I, you know, I, the first summer I went to Spain, I went to um, the States, I went to India, I went to South and Central America. So like I never even came home. So, and then I moved to New York. Um, so I suppose from 18 to 26, um, I was living away and then I came home um, and I suppose I was traveling a lot with work and then I had um, a relapse um, with uh, my anorexia and I think that I really needed like extra support. Um, so that was why I kind of stayed at home and then I think it just got to the point where I was like, no, I really need my own independence. And I think actually, and you, you'll understand this, Marion, it's, it's a part of recovery where you start thinking I'm able to take care of myself and this kind of desire to take care of yourself, which I think that for so long, because actually with, with an addiction, like it really infantilizes you um, in a lot of ways, like it really stunts your emotional growth. So I think that I had concentrated so like hard and like was working so hard with the recovery that all of a sudden I sort of came to and, and looked around and thought, oh my God, everyone is, way ahead of me and like I'm what am I doing and I'm still living at home and you know and it just I think from my own sort of sense of self I was like I really need to sort of take this on this next space um so just did like a little renovation job on uh, like this old farmhouse which my parents it's on their land so it was what they initially um bought and um, so it's like it predates famine times like it's really I feel like there's like it's haunted um and it's been, it's just been so much fun to, because, you know, I've always loved fashion, but I've never cared, like, I've never looked at interiors because I never, like, had a place of my own, you know, and um, either it was rented or it was with um, my parents. So it's just been so lovely, like, when the renov renovation was finished, to actually just, like, find paintings and, and find, you know, furniture and, like, and, and just all these, you know, and, and it's it's interesting because I think I thought my taste would be slightly more classic. Um, and then I'm just like, I want color, I want print. Like I find a little monkey candlestick and I'm like, this is perfect. You know, so it's just, it's been really funny to, I suppose, see um, just the way my taste is kind of manifesting itself. I just want, I just want so much color. Um, and I mean, you'll understand this because your house is really colorful as well. Um, but uh, it's just been just an enormous amount of fun um, and I don't know I feel like and Marianne it's so silly at 35 but like I feel like an adult 
Do you know? Completely. No, completely. When I first got sober, um, uh, I moved into um, a rent controlled place. I was minding for somebody else and I had no money. And I used to go to all the secondhand shops and like the most beautiful things I'd find, you know, like, yeah. like curtains that people didn't want anymore. Or like, I, I was mad for the candles, the novel yeah. candles. Like I just, I couldn't get enough of them. Apart from your monkey candle, is there anything like really delicious that you're after getting? Oh, I'm trying to think. Um, like I bought this amazing table, um, which again, it's beginning to sound like there's a lot of animals in because uh, it's got like a, a gold kind of flamingo, like the, the leg of it, which I, which I really love. Yeah, and this really cool lamp. So like, it's just, it's really small things. And like, you know, I was obviously, I was really lucky because like I inherited some stuff that my parents gave me. So it's really beautiful um, gilt um, mirror that like an antique. And most excitingly, I have to say was this, I was really lucky. They gave me um, uh, the fireplace, which actually is, I think it's over 200 years um, uh, old. And it was my, 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 great great granddad like it came from his home place so it's this incredible like it's this really beautiful the like green tile like it's so it's so unusual and um, and uh i yeah I, i'm kind of and you'll appreciate this marion because i know that you love like autumn and winter as well but i just can't wait like to light the fire and like really excited about lighting my own fire in my own house <laughs> so yeah these are my like minor thrills right now Oh, listen, I completely get it. And I wish we could live in permanent autumn. And yeah. we talk a bit about your love of clothes because it pops up and after the signs, like one of the ways that he terrorizes her is by buying her like, I mean, God, I can't even say it. I was being, being crass, forgive me. But like, he buys I was, I was thinking of a really crass joke as well. So I was like, okay, we're like, it's sick. Yeah. Cause he buys her Simone Russia dresses. Like he buys her beautiful things. Oh. But like that she needs to be really, really thin to get into. But yeah. I know, like, I know that you love beautiful clothes as well. Yeah. And uh, you were on Ireland AM this morning and you had a fantastic dress on. It looked actually quite Victorian. Like it, yeah. it, like it suits your lighting. I think, <laughs> yes, oh, my, like my ghostly lighting yes. here. Deliberate. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, that was a Helen Steele dress that she was kind enough um, to lend me. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, it's funny. I always, even as a kid, like I loved clothes. And I think it was partly because I saw them almost like a costume. Um, and, you know, that you could, I don't know, like form a new identity with them. Um, and, you know, it's been interesting because obviously, you know, I worked in fashion um, in New York. And I think when you're in that kind of job, even though like I loved everybody that I worked with so much, like I'm still really friendly with all of these people. They were just wonderful. But like there is an element of, you know, you, when you come into work, people kind of look you up and down. And um, and I think I, you know, with, like everything that I wore during that time was like thrifted or it was, you know, it was secondhand. It was charity shops. Um, and I suppose my aesthetic was very like would have been much more inspired by like what was cool in London, which was very it was much more grungy. Whereas I think in New York, it's a very polished, you know, your hair is perfectly done. The nails are perfectly done. That kind of Calvin Klein, you know, Jill Sanders, slightly 90s, you know, understated chic. Um, and, you know, but, you know, I still I think I just kind of kept true to myself. And but what was funny, I think, was when I moved home was I really kind of rejected it like I and I, I see now that when I am writing that I really tend like I, I I tend not to like I don't put on makeup I I just tie up my hair like I'll be in sweats and I think it's sort of like a deliberate part of me that's like nearly like this must be what it's like to be a man where it's like I don't give any sort of consideration to I'm like what I to what I look like yeah, yeah. But, um, and then I think, but you know, it's funny because and then I love the, the other part of my life where when I'm doing events or when I'm getting my photo taken, um, you know, to get, to get dressed up, you know, cause I just like, I love it. And I especially love Marion when I'm going to meet you for lunch. And sometimes I think, oh, I haven't, I've never worn that headpiece. And then I think, but Marion will really appreciate this. Cause whenever I see you, you're so, you're like, and I, I, I know I'm the same with you, but we're like, oh, I love this. I love this. I love this. And it's just this, like, there's something about, and I don't know if it's cause I went to an all girls school, but I just love like other women telling me, 
you know, oh, I love your earrings or I love your dress. Whereas if my boyfriend says it, I'm a bit like, sure, what would you, you know, like, I'm like, whatever, what would you know? But like, it's yeah. so, it means so much more, I think, when another woman says it. Yeah, because we're coming from an informed place. Yeah, and what I love about you, I'm sorry, everyone who's listened, this is a bit of a mutual loving at the moment, but she's <laughs> so adorned. Like she wears crowns and and she's and she's tall, you know, and she looks like a queen. And it, you always look fabulous, Louise. And I mean, I completely know what you mean about that, that, that kind of New York look. It is so careful. It's all kind of beige cashmere mm. and, you know, perfect, smooth hair. And funnily enough, I went on the J. Crew website this morning and I came away feeling like I had just been thrown out of a country club. It's just these perfect people with their perfect little yeah. bodies living their perfect little lives um they wouldn't wear crowns would you no. wear a crown crowns yeah. are excellent but i uh, always think i always think you look amazing as well like the last day when she she turned up in this toast dress and i texted her later and i was like would it be really weird if i bought it as well and now i'm afraid that like we're going to turn up to something in our matching dresses i was really hoping that you would wear it tonight because then i would have worn mine as well we should have organized we it we should have we should have um Staying kind of on the, the fashion theme, have you read The Chiffon Trenches by Leon, Andre Leon Talley? I haven't, and I am dying to read it because I read like a few extracts and a few reviews, and it looked, it is, I mean, it looked amazing. Law dropping. It's, mm. it's about a man, uh, a fashion man, a gay mm. fashion man um, who was, was he Anna Wintour's assistant? He wasn't her yeah. assistant. He was something. He was pals with her in some way and pals with Karl Lagerfeld and it's just about how how fashion people are you know just how how they are yeah. I won't say anymore yeah because um, yeah, cause it, you know I, it's interesting because you know he would have been I suppose one of the rare you know black men um and particularly black gay men at, at such a hot like you know it was really him Grace Coddington and um Anna at the top of Vogue um and you know a very good friend of mine who was an intern um, at Elle um, and is now the fashion editor, a uh, fashion ed editor of a magazine who um, is a black woman. You know, it was, it's very interesting hearing her experiences um, and particularly um, it seems to me when she travels, you know, she said that like when she's in Italy or, you know, places like that where she is really treated with like, just, yeah, and it's terrible. Like it's really terrible. Um, and so I think, I think all facets of life um, and all industries have had to have like a like a massive reckoning um, I think when it comes um, to these issues and to privilege but I'm definitely I'm going to pick that book up it's unputdownable I mean it's shocking it's gripping it's gas it's yeah. tragic as well you know and so even though like you loved fashion and you loved clothes what awakened your feminism because mm. it's it's not easy i think to be a self-starter feminist in ireland well it wasn't mm. anyway it really wasn't something that was nurtured and mm. celebrated mm. well i mean i was firstly like my first sort of introduction to it would have been like the spice girls you know with girl power and that kind of sense of yeah you know girls can do anything um, and then I think when I was 15, which I've spoken about before, you know, I read um, The Handmaid's Tale um, and I think that really awakened it. But you know what, Marion, I think it's constantly, sh you know, shifting and the like, changing because I think I would have said I was a feminist and like I was reading, you know, when I went to university, I was very drawn towards, you know, gender and sexualities and women writing war and post-colonial women's writing and, you know, all of these subjects that I suppose had feminism or women at their heart. Um, and even though I would have considered myself a feminist, even though I think I would have, I suppose, you know, flown that flag, like I, there was definitely, there was so much internalized misogyny. There was so much, I think, like slut shaming and, you know, judging other women um, and kind of competitive, competitiveness. And also I think, you know, even just things like, I would have been very hard on my boyfriend at the time, like, you know, really, kind of been quite angry if I felt like he wasn't playing into like really strict gender roles you know and um, and like you know let's say if he couldn't put up the tent when we we're at a festival like I would feel like really disgusted you know like the poor like I mean I can't put up a tent either 
Um, and I suppose even like recognizing things like that I held my mother up to a much higher standard um, than I held my father up to, you know, that I felt like my father deserved a medal just for it kind of turning up. Um, and that I, I, I carried like a lot of anger towards my mother for years for, for nothing, you know, just for, for really nothing. Um, so I think that when I was in New York, um, and when I had, I, you know, I had a relapse with um, the anorexia, quite a severe one, and I was working with a really good therapist there. Um, and I think so much of the work that she did was like really trying to help me understand, I suppose, the way in which society. And I'm like, I'm not blaming. Like, I think it's a bit easy. Like, you, you know, this as well, Mary. Like addictions are so complex that there's like a myriad of different reasons but I think she was trying to sort of help me understand I suppose how society and 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 the conditioning that I had you know grown up with that taught me to believe that that I needed to take up less space in the world in order to be more worthy um, and I suppose to see how that had kind of played into my eating disorder and I think that when you when you see that like you know that whole it's such a cliche now but like the thing of being woke like once you're woke like once the blinkers are off it's really hard um to to go back and I think a lot of it was anger like you start thinking this has taken a lot of time from me this has taken a lot of money from me this has taken a lot of energy from me opportunities parties I've missed you know nights out I've missed because I just wasn't able um and I think that when that kind of when your shame, I think, crystallizes and hardens and turns to anger, which I think is happening for a lot of women, actually, when they have that awakening, because you're taught to feel shame. And then when that kind of like turns into a fury, like there's a real driving force in that. Um, and I think I allow that to kind of fuel me. Um, and I was very much like, OK, now I am a feminist. But I think, again, Marion, like if I look at, you know, where I was at 26, it's different now again like now I'm more concerned with intersectional feminism like you know how does this impact women of color um, and like trans women you know and I think it's trying to make sure that like my feminism is not white middle class kind of you know like that kind of posh you know like guardian reading um feminism it's like no it needs to be you know just more inclusive more radical I think um and uh yeah, so I think, as I said, it's kind of, it's constantly, it's constantly evolving. Yeah, I mean, I think it has to, um, mm -hmm. because, well, we're constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. And also, it takes a very, very long time um, to even see uh, the constraints of yeah. misogyny. And it takes a really long time. Like, I, I was so used to it for so long that I didn't even know it was there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it takes time and work and other people calling us out um before before it can be dismantled and um yeah i mean just something that happened to me that i told you about like you know i'm very kind of kind of rah 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 about only recommending female writers um and recently enough i don't know in the last three or four months somebody said yeah you know you listed a whole load of um women writers there but not one of them was black mm. and like you know and it was interesting because my first response was kind of a defensive one yeah you no know? um it, it was a kind of like no but i'm i'm on the side of good do you know that sort of response yeah. that no they're absolutely right yeah. um so yeah um sometimes the flaws in it, or the gaps in my feminism need to be pointed out to me and like it's never a comfortable experience no it's um, not but it's, I'm, definitely not. it's something i'm grateful for but yeah. um yeah now look at I think we're on question asking time. Oh Christ, we've gone a minute over. I apologize. No, yeah. I to get me, me, my specs. Hold on there now. Um, um, do bear with me a second. Uh, I get me. Uh, oh God, there's loads and loads and loads and loads of questions. Okay. Um, somebody called Karen. Karen Kelleher. Hello. Says hello, Louise. What have you learned from writing after the silence? Goodness. Um. Well, I suppose, as, as I said earlier, like, I think one of the, the biggest lessons that I've probably taken away from it is 
just to really remember how prevalent um, this issue is, um, you know, as uh, talking about coercive control and domestic violence, because I think what's really interesting is that after asking for it was released, you know, I was inundated with people like men and women telling me their stories of sexual violence. Um, and what's really interesting is, is that no one has ever told me that they're in an abusive relationship. Um, and I, and you know, if you look at the statistics, like I must know someone, but I, I can't tell you who that might be. Um, and I, I can't even begin to imagine, you know, um, and I think that it just goes to show, I think, how much secrecy and this sort of culture of shame that still um, surrounds this issue. And I just think that it's definitely something that we need to talk about more openly. Um, and I think really to try and, dismantle that shame and so much of that is really going to be us all examining the kind of internal misogyny that leads us to believe like why do these women stay you know like why don't they leave this would never happen to me i would never put up with this um, and i think the further we 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 talk like that and the further we like the more we use that kind of language i think the more that it silences victims and the more it shames them and um, so i think that would probably be for me what the thing that i've taken away yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, instead of asking, why did she stay with him? You know, we should instead be asking, why are men so violent? Yeah. Um, so bear with me. Oh, somebody said, just noticed you have similar shaped earrings. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, so we have. Um, Louise, I walked past you in Cork City a few years ago and you stopped me and said you loved my trousers. I wasn't sure it was you at first, but I really appreciated it and remember it because I had been feeling crap that day. Oh. Excellent. Message to everybody, if you see something you like about another woman, tell her. Yes, yes. yes. I always do it. And, you know, it's funny because Richard sometimes laughs because I'm always like, oh, I love that, I love that. But it honestly, I feel like it makes people's day. Like, it would make my day. Absolutely. Listen, a lovely message in. Cecilia Hearn says, hi. Oh. Hi, Cecilia. <laughs> Hope you're well. Dying to read Freckles. When oh, yes, yeah, same here. Is it October? It'll be out in October, I think. Um, okay, I, this is a lovely question. What is the best experience that writing has given you? What is the best experience? Um, you know what I think, um, I mean, there's so many. And I mean, on a, on a purely, I think, day-to-day -day basis, like when I was working in New York, like, I just think I realized pretty, like, quickly, this doesn't suit me, you know, this kind of grind and being in an office and having to, you know, when you're an introvert, having to talk to people all the day and being very subject to other people's whims and other people's moods. And I just found it really exhausting. And I think there's something about, like, working from home, which I think is going to be a really interesting lesson for everyone after this, is that you really start to trust your own rhythms. Like, I might do so much work one day and then the next day think, oh God, I actually, I can't, I, I can't do anything today. And like accepting that and kind of going with that. And then the next day, again, you'll get loads of work done. And by the end of the week that it all kind of evens out. But I think it's sort of trusting in yourself, trusting in your instincts and knowing when to push yourself, but also knowing when to take a break. And I actually think that's much harder when you're working in a job where they insist that you be in there from nine to five. And the thing is, is that everybody knows this. You might have three hours work in you one day and then six hours work in you the next day. And I think there has to be more of a flexibility. So I'm really glad, I suppose, to have a job that allows me to, I think, go with my natural rhythms when it comes to work. Yeah, yeah, we're not machines um let me see um, um 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 please bear with me um oh uh louise um i'd be interested to know why this is your favorite of all your books louise um well i don't think i don't think louise said it was the favorite of all her books um, oh i did marion oh, i did, did. i said it multiple times i beg your complete pardon did which i know is a terrible thing to say i know it's a terrible thing to say as a writer um but I don't know. You know what? I think it was that I felt the most in control of it. Um, I felt in a weird way, the most emotionally distant from it, probably because I have absolutely nothing in common with Keelan. Um, and I don't know. So for that reason, it felt more like I was a proper writer rather than I think mining my own 
pain or my own experiences, I think, to create art. Um, and I suppose as well, I sometimes felt like I was being pigeonholed as, or sorry, not pigeonholed. I think sort of I felt like I was being categorized as a literary author. And I never thought of myself as a literary author. And I kind of wasn't that keen on the, the I, not, I mean, I love literary fiction, but I just didn't think that was, I suppose, where I fit. Um, and I suppose with this book, I wanted to really like kind of lean into my very commercial sensibilities um, and this sense of, you know, a page turner and quite, you know, like really well paced and kind of and and also just the glamour and the beauty of it. Um, while also, you know, as I said, um, still like. I was still putting in things that I felt were important and it was funny because when my dad read it he said because you know when he he goes skiing every year when he goes he brings um like Harlan Coben and you know like uh da you know like kind of like thrillers he loves thrillers and um, so he said to me when he came back he said it was like one of the books that I love but your voice was still in there and I just thought yeah that was exactly what I was trying to achieve so I think that was why it's my, probably my favorite that that's absolutely lovely listen will you tell us about when your dad read only ever yours which was your first book it's so funny i didn't know you then but i am um, i followed you on twitter and and i saw that you had tweeted about it and mm. and the whole thing is sort of gas i mean i think for anyone who writes a novel for their parents to read it especially their father especially if there's something sexy in it yeah. <laughs> anyway i can't remember exactly what you, you tweeted but it was lovely tell us yeah um, I'm trying to think now. I mean, you know, firstly, I remember when you followed me because I, I was in the cinema with my mother. We had gone to see some terrible movie. I think it was like with Cameron Diaz or something. And I honestly nearly had a heart attack. I was like, oh my God, Mary Hughes has followed me. Mary Hughes has followed me. I was like beside myself. Because I thought for years, like I, I had been such a fan of yours for years. And I always had this feeling. I was like, I think if we met, we'd be great friends. Um, which I realize now is a slightly stalkerish thing to think, and I'm sure loads of people think that about you, but I just had this like this instinct. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm trying to think what he said about that one. I mean, I know with um, asking for it, like, you know, he was really, because he's the first one to read all of them. Um, and I think The Surface Price is his favorite, um, and which I was kind of surprised at. I'm trying to think what he said about Only, or Only Ever Yours. Um, he really didn't like Sarah in Almost Love, which always made me laugh. And he kept saying to me, I feel really sorry for father, which felt very pointed, but anyway. Um, and, I, and with asking for it, he was really, I remember like, he was very kind of wise about it. Like he was saying, you know, he said, this is going to be a really important book and I hope you're ready. And, you know, he said, that, he said, when people read this, there will be people who realize that they've been raped and there will be people who will realize that they've raped someone. And he said, some people will not want to have that realization and you will have been the messenger. And I was a bit like, you know, kind of taken aback. And I think nothing can prepare you um, for something like that anyway. But so, yeah, he's quite a he's quite a wise um, kind of like a, a, a sort of this Buddha that stands in the corner and just sort of comes out with these very wise statements now and then. Yeah, you make it sound like he only speaks twice a year. <laughs> gather on he's, so, he's, got, he's saying something, hold on. You know, and then when he says it, that it's yeah. fabulous, you know, and people write it down and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Cecilia says her book is not out until t October 2021. Oh no, Cecilia, <laughs> how dare you? Ah, come on now, and getting us all excited. Why is it taking so long? <laughs> I'm sure 2020 has been a hard year, Cecilia. Come on now, we need yeah, it. It has, it has, it has. Um, okay, Karen McCandless, which is a great name, says, why do you think Irish people make such good storytellers? Oh, I mean, I think, I remember hearing you talk about this before, about the idea of, um, I suppose, that kind of Hiberno um, English. And, you know, Richard and I went to... Um, we went to Kerry recently, we went to the Blasket Islands and they were obviously talking about, you know, all these incredible writers um, who had come from the Blasket Islands and, you know, including, you know, um, Peg Sayers, which is obviously the, the renowned one. And the guide, you know, said something really interesting where he, I think he was talking about just how important stories were um, at that time. And when when you have, I suppose, a, a society of people who haven't been educated 
because like a, I suppose a, a foreign ruler wants to take their language away from them. Um, the idea of, I think, passing down these stories when you can't write them down, like passing them on orally just became so incredibly important. And I think there is that culture of, of just, of storytelling. And I think there's a real, which I, I haven't really noticed as much in other cultures, but I know even as a teenager, you know, someone who could tell a good story. And I don't mean that in the sense that they would say, you know, once upon a time, but even that something had happened to them and then they're telling you the story, like everybody loved it, you know, and I think it's like that person still, I think, is given sort of like extra attention or, or is sort of prized more, you know, at a party or in company that we sort of, I think, hold them up um, in a in a higher esteem, I think, um, than maybe they do in other cultures, and I think it is something to do with that that idea of uh, storytelling being really important in our culture. Yeah, I mean, I think because I think for any colonized people, if you know if their language is taken, if they mm -hmm. don't have the right to own land, if they don't have the right to uh, practice their religion, there are things that can't be ta taken, mm -hmm. and and like storytelling and music. Are, yeah. are some of those things and I think for a long time they were kind of how we kept ourselves defined mm -hmm. um Irish people. and I, I think we sort of egg each other on I mean definitely as you say I think we um we reward good storytellers yeah. you know yeah. with kind of social currency like yeah. uh, you know and I mean there are some fabulous people like my mother could tell a riveting story about changing a light bulb and yeah. you would be like just and then what happened? Yeah. We have the gift. Mm. Now, we have time for one more question. And I realized when I said that I would pick the most interesting, it was not my choice to make. It's Louise's choice. If it was up to me, I would pick a thing that isn't even the question. It was the one about the nice trousers. But it is up to Louise to pick the best question. Now, hold on. I'll give you one more. And then, and then, yeah. Ha, I love this. If you ever met Beyonce, what would you say? <laughs> oh my God, I don't think I would be able to say anything. I think I would just be standing there going, I am obsessed with you. Um, do you know what I think about Beyonce though, which I just admire so much, is that, you know, and she's a Virgo, Marion, she's like you. Um, so, you know, I think it's that, it's that appreciation of hard work. Because I think you have someone who is very gifted, you know, it has a naturally beautiful singing voice and is a very good dancer and is obviously physically really stunning. And then I think it's just the drive and the capacity for just the work. Um, and I think that that's what, you know, that's what's going to take you, I suppose, to genius level. That's what's going to take you to being an icon um, is, marrying you know talent with the hard work because you know this as well like people always say what's the secret to writing or you know how do I write a book and and I like talent is actually such a small part of it like the biggest part is sitting down at your computer and actually doing the work yeah I remember after you saw the documentary um uh, about her appearance at Coachella um and they showed her when she started back in training mm. and and like she was still carrying some of the baby weight and I hate myself for even saying that phrase um but you know she was on fit she hadn't danced yeah, for a yeah. while and she said something about it's very humbling yeah and, you know yeah. the hard work is humbling yeah and, and it really does show that like you don't just wake up one morning and be Beyonce yeah and but Marion, you know that as well. Like, you know, the thing is is that when you write a book, right? Let's say that Grown Ups came out in February and it's this huge success. And then what's so humbling is having to go back to your computer, back to your blank word doc, and be faced with all of your own insecurities, all of your, you know, well, maybe not for you, but I know for myself, all of my own limitations as a writer. And like that's humbling. Like that's humbling being met with that, like again and again, you know. No, yeah, I mean, I, I, I absolutely agree. And on that cheery note, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I think I speak for both of us when I say how incredibly fortunate we feel um, mm -hmm. to have the job we do. Um, mm -hmm. And to thank you so much to all of you who have joined in tonight. And thank you to all of you who've sent your questions and, and become part of, of this lovely event. Uh, it, for me, it's always like such a huge, huge pleasure to talk to Louise. I loved After the Silence. I am certain that you will also. Um, 
thank you to everyone at Waterstones um, and everyone, um, Will and Hannah and everyone who worked tonight to make and to myself who uh, did all the tech stuff for us as well. So thank you again and, and stay safe and mind yourselves. And thank you. Big round of applause for Louise. <laughs> and for you, Marion. Thank you. Thank you.